<laughs> yeah. So it's extremely grateful to you for agreeing to give this talk uh, on the third Krishna Unni Memorial Lecture. And I would also like to welcome all my colleagues and especially uh, Dr. Krishna Unni's sisters and his other relatives to participate. And also Dr. Sridhamurti, who is uh, going to chair this uh, today's session. So I welcome you all, and uh, as you all know that uh, this, in the memory of Dr. Krishnanuni, this uh, lecture series we have started, and this is the third in the series, and uh, very eminent people from all over the world who know Krishnanuni very well have agreed to come and uh, deliver this talk. And uh, today's, uh, I think the talk is very important about the regimentation of the Gondwana and uh, I think uh, one of the software which has been written is the instrumental Professor Colin Reeves which he has used to do so I think we are going to have extremely uh, novel and uh, different ideas on this how this all happened and uh, especially uh, I recall Rasik would remember when we set up our second station in Antarctica the idea was it is on the east side of the Antarctica. An idea was to take up the study on the fragmentation. Uh, and I think uh, this problem is still very, very much uh, alive. And I think it would be extremely useful for us to get the uh, knowledge from Professor Reeves, who is one of the topmost uh, exploration geophysicists in the world. And uh, we are extremely grateful for. Uh, is agreeing to. With this uh, few words, I again welcome you all and I request uh, Professor Siddharmurthy to chair the session and introduce the speaker. Mr. President, I agree yes. to introduce, but the chairing the session is your job, but I will definitely be your assistant. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. President of the meeting. You can't overrule president. You can't overrule president. <laughs> president of the meeting, Dr. Shailesh Nayak. Speaker of the day, Professor Colin Reeves. Family members of Revered Sri Krishna Nunigaru and friends. It is a pleasure and privilege for me to formally introduce Professor Colin Reeves to these video attendees, even though he does not need an introduction to many of you. Professor Reeves, as has already been stated, had his education in England and, and he, obtained, he obtained a postgraduate degree in geophysics and a PhD in geophysics. But unlike the other youngsters, immediately he jumped into the field and moved to the very cold continent of Canada. There, straight away he went to Botswana to conduct maybe one of the very first nation, nationwide uh, gravity surveys. I don't want to go into most of it because all of this has been given in his CVs and some of you will be, I'm sure, have read it or have gone through and have an opportunity to go through it again. What I really remember is Collins' travel in 1983 from Canada to Delft, the Netherlands, to attend an interview for the post of Professor of Geophysics, which was newly created in ITC. Colin, by then, already he had an impeccable, impeccable academic record, had published practically in every journal around the world, including Nature. Some of us only hear about it. He has already published more than one paper in Nature, and he was the obvious choice for the professor. Of, uh, pro professor. And I was fortunate to be his colleague for a few months till 1984, before, by then I returned to India. But we continued our friendship and we continued our contacts. What 
ITC has ITC as for the information. One I want to tell you, draw students from all over the world, mostly from the developing countries, mostly from Asia and Africa, and all these students were so fortunate that Colin molded them, their lives, and then made them progress in their careers. Some of them occupied extremely high positions in most of these countries, and most of them, of course, have already superannuated too. <laughs> Fortunate to obtain your degrees, both postgraduate and PhD. I'm sure Dr. Sahu must be hearing it here, is under the guidance of Professor Reeves. But what I really cherish is I would like to introduce Professor Colin Reeves as a friend of Indian geoscientists. His contribution to the Indian geosciences is second to none. He traveled to India any number of times and he advised scientists in various national organizations like NGRI, AMD, GSI, ONGC, NIO, Reliance and so on and lectured in various universities even to the school going children. One such occasion which warrants a mention was he acting as a convener for a workshop on airborne geophysics, which preceded the second international seminar in 1996, November 1996. Immediately after that, I just want to show we organized so many workshops, but within a period of one year, this is what he brought out. A textbook on airborne geophysics, one of its kind in, at that time in the world. And this book was a joint publication by AEG and ITC and was released in Toronto Exploration 1997. That means within a year, the book on net, it was circulated, articles were got and articles from all over the world which were presented in the workshop were brought out in the form of a book. But what is more interesting and beneficial to India was Colin went on to submit a project to Netherlands government for funding to strengthen digital methods in geoscientific institutions in India. Against very heavy odds, he got $1.6 million grant for the project and overcoming various obstacles and difficulties the project was housed in the Geological Survey of India. It is at this stage I wish to pay tribute to Sri Krishnanuni, but for his wise counsel and hard work wherein he stayed in Delhi for weeks together to prepare the background material for the project, the project would not have been housed in the Geological Survey of India. Anyway, with Sri E.V.R. Pardasaradiyaru as the project manager, Myself as the resident project coordinator of ITC, the project was a great success. Under the project, 25 people went to ITC as training of trainers, no, not at, at free, uh, which was free. In a, and these 25 people, when they came back, they trained over 100 people, over 1,000 people from various geological organizations in and around India in the digital methods in geosciences. That's the contribution which Professor Colin Reeves has done. And the institute, Colin, you'll be happy to know the institute is strong, is going on. And, uh, and uh, next time when you are here, I'm sure we would like to felicitate you there. I don't want to take any more of your time. I have already taken more than you, uh, what is needed, except to say that it's not only in India, Colin has set up similar institutions, similar facilities all over the world, and some of and some of them are still functioning. He is a he is a sought after speaker in any international seminar, and he and he he convened a number of seminars himself. With these few words, I on all 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 your behalf, I request no. Sir to deliver his. This third Krishnanuni Memorial Invited Lecture. Professor Colin Rees, please. Thank you, Sridhar Murthy, for that uh, kind introduction. Thanks also to the chairman. Uh, can you all hear me? 
Yes, okay, mm -hmm. then, then I go ahead. Let me say, first of all, that uh, I find this uh, a, a great honor and uh, a, to, to deliver this lecture and a, a great pleasure to be amongst so many uh, of, of my friends in India once again, uh, albeit from a distance, uh, thanks to uh, this uh, conference technology. Perhaps one day we can meet again in person. Um, now, let me... Uh, share my screen with you. Is that... Oh, no, no, okay. C can you see the screen now? Is, is, is my title slide visible? Hello? Yeah, it's perfect, Colin. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Yes, Fine. we are seeing. We are seeing. Okay, excellent. Then let me start by making uh, some introduction. Um, The, the title of the, the, the talk is How India Parted Company from Gondwana. And uh, I wanted to start with some historical background because I think for the occasion this is, uh, this is most relevant. So um, I want to show you first of all this picture which was taken in July of 1957. Mm -hmm. And it shows the uh, the Indian Prime Minister Pandit Nehru on an early visit that he paid to ITC in Delft in July 1957. And here you see he is being hosted by Professor Willem Skemmerhorn, who was the uh, the founder of ITC and uh, literally moved heaven and earth to uh, to set the institute up in in 1950. And the, the initials, people always ask me, what do the initials ITC stand for? Well, originally it was the International Training Center for Aerial Survey, and it has undergone many changes of name subsequently, but the initials ITC have survived. And the particular relevance for the present meeting is the fact that in the years... Um, 1969 to 71, uh, Sri Krishna Nuni studied in this very building that you see in the photograph and obtained his MSc in, in photogeology. And in, in a way, at the end of my talk, I'm going to come back to this idea because the work that I'm describing to you, uh, I think, is, is really a variation on the theme of, of photogeology because uh, as you will see, I've been trying to understand how the oceans were, in, were created through studying uh, what they look like in various images. So let's move on. Here's an Im image of Gondwana that you will find very easily on, uh, on Wikipedia. And it is a South Polar view. And most people these days, particularly, uh, I would say, uh, people in, in secondary school will all tell you a few things. Uh, the southern continents of today were once part of a united supercontinent called Gondwana. And towards the end of the Paleozoic era, about 300 million years ago, Gondwana was close to the southern geographic pole and was largely ice covered, uh, a bit in the way that, uh, that Antarctica is at the moment, we must imagine. And finally, the third point, India escaped from the rest of Gondwana at some stage and moved rapidly northwards in the Mesozoic and Cenozoic times, eventually colliding with Asia with the formation of the Himalaya. Now, I'm going to be talking today mostly about the earlier part of this process, 
and here are a number of topics that I want to address and um, starting off with the concept what what is the correct fit of the Gondwana fragments now back in 1988 this geological map of Gondwana was published by Martin De Witt and uh, a team of co-workers based uh, mostly in South Africa, but with contributions from many other parts of the world. And wherever you travel, you find copies of this map on the walls of ge geological institutes the world over. Unfortunately, the map is now more than 40 years old. It uh, predates all the wonderful imagery we now have of the world's ocean floors. And when I first saw this map, my interest was fired because I felt that this map was a, a great step forward. It, it set the pace in many new ways. But philosophically, there were some difficulties for me because not least, um, we could see these gaps between the continents in this free assembly. And in the days before we knew what the ocean floors looked like so well, philosophically you had to say, well, these can't really have been gaps. There must have been some form of Earth's crust filling these gaps. And then if that is the case, what became of it? And, and where is it now? And secondly, the... Um, there's been a, quite a, a lot of important work recently measuring marine magnetic anomalies, which of course give us some timing on the events of Gondwana splitting up. And in particular, perhaps the most relevant piece of work has been in this region here, um, between Mozambique in Africa and uh, uh, drawing Mordland in Antarctica, and I want to start by uh, talking about the, the optimal fit that we should adopt for, for these two parts of Gondwana. Africa and Antarctica are the two biggest fragments. And if we can get those right, then we should in turn get the, uh, the smaller fragments into the correct position. <coughs> now, here's another map that's even uh, slightly older. This is more than 50 years ago. Smith and Hallam published in Nature a paper entitled The Fit of the Southern Continents. What they used essentially was an extension of the, uh, the Bullard computerized fit methods that were applied to the Atlantic margins. And this was the, the result of that study that was published in Nature in, in 1970. And this has this is stood the test of time in many ways. West Gondwana, uh, their fit is not so different from what people would advocate today. The same is true for East Gondwana. But then somewhere in between, we have a discrepancy because where Smith and Hallam fitted Sri Lanka into this concave dip in the uh, in the uh, Antarctic margin. In fact, it is this convex part of the coast of Mozambique that should fit there. So here we have a, a, a mismatch. And unfortunately for many reasons, I, I guess because the correct version hasn't been published well enough yet, uh, you still see this incorrect uh, fit uh, repeated in, in many publications even to this day. Let me try to convince you of the, uh, the evidence that supports this fit. Here we have two images of the, from the world uh, gravity coverage. And on Africa, we see this arcuate feature off the coast of Mozambique. And at the same scale, we see the same feature of Antarctica. And if we see these in their global context, we have Mozambique here, 
we have um, Antarctica down here. And although they're now separated by a distance of 6,000 kilometers, this is really what global tectonics is all about. Continents travel large distances, but the, uh, the footprints they leave behind are often well preserved and allow us to interpret the means by which they, they made these enormous journeys over periods of, of geological time. Jumping somewhat to the end of the story, here is uh, what is known as a flow line that connects these two points, one in Africa, the other in Antarctica, symmetrical about the, uh, the Southwest Indian Ridge here. And as you will know, as oceans spread from this, uh, this early example from the North Atlantic Ocean, magnetic stripes are frozen into the, uh, the newly formed crust. So, it, so is it the world over. And here is uh, a map showing all the magnetic anomalies picked along that uh, 6,000 kilometer track. Uh, a few things to notice. We've got in blue the latest observations from uh, Miller and Jokat that were published just two years ago, both in uh, the sea off Mozambique and in the sea off Antarctica. And most important, well, these show that the, the spreading apart goes on to this day. But most important for what I'm going to be talking about is the fact that we've got this Cretaceous quiet zone from about 121 to 83 million years ago in which we don't have any of these ocean floor stripes. So we, we don't have the, uh, the best type of data for defining the positions of continents at, the, at bygone times. So here is what um, I support as the, the best uh, present uh, reassembly of the Gondwana fragments. We've now got this error corrected here, and now we've got Sri Lanka nestling into the, the small space that exists between India and Antarctica uh, with um, the Napier complex in Antarctica nestling into this angle in the east coast of India. So we've got this piece right, but it's a very important piece of the puzzle, as I will show you later on. The next two questions I want to address can hardly be separated from each other. Uh, if we want to describe the outline of a continent, what should we use to define that outline? Uh, and once we've defined it, how close should it be to the outline of the conjugate continent? And neither of these questions are, are easily answered. To illustrate the point, I'll, I'll use the, uh, the current reassembly, and this has been stable with uh, me and the team from uh, IGCP 628 now for a number of years. And here in green, we see the coastlines of the southern continents in that reassembly. But as geologists, we all know that coastlines come and go as sea levels rise and fall. So they're only geological margins insofar as they limit the extent that the, the field geologists with a hammer and a compass can physically see uh, rocks on the land surface. The early work of uh, Smith and Bullard and others used uh, bathymetric contours to help define the fit. But I would argue now that we've got uh, global gravity data, it's the gravity anomalies around the margins that are the more reliable markers of the continental edges. This is the same reassembly, but now in purple you see my interpretation of these uh, so-called gravity margins. In, uh, in support of that, 
perhaps something that's more familiar to people who've worked with continental geology. Um, I'm adding this layer, and this in pink now is areas that I describe as Precambrian, where the Precambrian rocks are either outcropping or are covered only by a, a thin veneer of, of younger sediments. And uh, where they're outcropping, in general, you can say that they are, they are mapped conventionally. Where they're only thinly covered, their anomaly patterns stand out clearly on uh, aeromagnetic surveys, uh, which, uh, as you know from the introduction, is one of the, uh, the techniques that I've spent the, the larger part of, of my career working on. Let's bring this into an Indian context. Here is the, or is a global gravity image. There are several of these now in circulation from Earth orbiting satellites. Um, this is not even the most recent, but it serves to illustrate my point. This is from the Danish National Space Center in 2009. I think we can all recognize the outline of India from this image, but Let's add approximately the, the coastline here in white. And mm. All right. Uh, Maybe just leave this so we can see that we are still connected. Just sorry. Leave this the way it is mm -hmm. and just use that so we so can see that they are connected. Okay, right. Yeah. Okay, uh, hello again. Can you hear me now? We, we've done something that has turned the, the noise off, so uh, I will back up a few slides and, uh, and try again. We can hear you, sir. Let me pick up again from this point. I hope then you haven't uh, you haven't missed too much. What I've been trying to do is to prepare not only the situation at the start of disruption, but a continuous series of images from that start through uh, not to the present day, because I think the more recent past is well defined. But the challenge is to get from the start of disruption to the first of the anomalies of the uh, of the C series about 84 million years ago. So here is a, a summary of the geological time scale through the Phanerozoic. Gondwana was consolidated very early on in the in the Cambrian, and went through as a, as an entity right up until the uh, the start of the uh, the jurassic and then we have the onset of disruption an acceleration of the disruption uh at about the uh, the time of the jurassic cretaceous boundary and then around about 120 million years ago we get the start of the uh, cretaceous quiet zone so for a while we have absolutely no time control but we have good ocean floor imagery that should allow us to make a smooth interpolation. So the period I'm be, I've been concentrating on is this one, but relatively little happens during the Jurassic. Um, and from the um, end of the Cretaceous quiet zone, we've got good control over the uh, over the way things evolved. And to illustrate this point, let me show you a reconstruction at this time, where we have West Gondwana virtually intact and East Gondwana virtually intact and a relatively modest amount of disruption between the two. If we move ahead to the end of the, the quiet zone, you can recognize now very easily all the southern continents. 
and you can see a well-established series of mid-ocean ridges uh, separating them uh, in a way something like this. And the, uh, the work has been around making this happen in a way that the oceans only grow. Um, it is unusual for a growing ocean to stop and it's almost unknown for it to go into reverse. So um, making that rule work for all these different uh, margins simultaneously is, is quite a challenge. You can liken it to the fact that uh, if, if you draw a, a straight line between two points, that's dead easy. If you want to draw a straight line through three points, you have to start making some decisions as to what is credible, what is uh, slightly adjustable, and what is uh, plainly not to be believed. Now, this, this task is difficult, but I would argue now that the ocean floor data is, uh, is so good that if you do this carefully and with a lot of discipline, uh, your the data actually forces you into a corner so is the uh, the correct answer or as close as you can get to it so let me illustrate the result by uh, looking at the uh, by way of example to the tectonic evolution of the east coast of india here we've got the the geology of india less the cenozoic uh, cover together with the geology of Antarctica and the fit um, requires a, a fairly narrow strip in this case it's about 75 kilometers wide that uh, follows this arcuate shape it's probably the original line of rifting which uh, in turn probably followed closely the weaknesses of the Eastern Ghats mobile belt <laughs> and what I've done in this illustration is to outline an area of crust that fills this gap and that area I've attached to both coastlines so that as we move them apart, we get an idea of uh, what happens to the, the crust as it's stretched and extended. Here's the fit. Here just... Uh, three or four million years into, uh, into disruption, we see already that the, uh, the, the crust is thin to half thickness because these two areas of crust are now no, no longer overlapping. So what was originally full thickness crust is now reduced to half thickness. And that happens relatively quickly along this arm where the separation is normal to the uh, to the spreading and here south of the uh, Krishna Godavari Delta uh, we've got more of a, a strike slip um, a, a, a bleak uh, rifting which means that it takes a while longer for the uh, the two parts of the uh, of the extended crust to completely separate and uh, get into the uh, the growth of, of new ocean just let you see that uh, once again so that you uh, see something about the effects of the the geometry of the rifts and the uh, the extension that goes on taking a slightly more distant view now this is at time uh, m0 the youngest of the m series anomalies and a few things I want to mention here. We're getting regular ocean growth just here, but we've got magnetic anomalies over here that define the relative position of Antarctica with respect to Africa. We've got magnetic anomalies up here that tell us where Madagascar is with respect to Africa. So it follows that we, we have the, this gap between Madagascar and Antarctica quite well defined. And you see here that all, although we've, uh, we've got quite a bit of growth going on here, the ocean tapers to the west 
and there's very little extra space in here than there was in, in the reassembly. And uh, this is one of the arguments in favor of the reassembly being tight, because if the, uh, if the assembly is, is much looser than we had it, then there's no longer space for both India and Sri Lanka between Madagascar and Antarctica at this time. So I'll take you through a series of, um, of images now that try to explain that in a little more uh, detail. Um, we've got, this is at 124 million. I'll go in steps of, um, of 4 million years. And there are magnetic anomalies here off Australia. We don't really know precisely the outline of uh, this, I suppose you could call Tibet, the piece of greater India that has disappeared into the Himalaya. But uh, this outline fits the, uh, the reassembly uh, rather well. And we've got magnetic anomalies in here that uh, define the speed of ocean opening off Western Australia. And that goes on, we get, uh, in fact, strike slip on this prominent fault feature of Western Australia. Um, we get initially very little movement between India and Madagascar. Eventually, the mid-ocean ridge in here dies out and jumps to much nearer the coast with India. Then we get the onset of uh, strike slip between India and Madagascar. And maybe for a while there's a, a role in here for the Kuduwadi lineament because the model has a pure strike slip uh, on this uh, fault line off the northeast coast of Madagascar. All the while we've got regular ocean growth going on down here. And at a certain moment, around about 90 million years ago, we get a, a, a change of things, an abrupt change. Uh, India starts moving off to the northeast. Let me run that backwards because I want you to watch in here the way in which the fracture zones off Sri Lanka telescope so well into those recorded off Antarctica. This tells us a number of things because by now Madagascar is uh, at, at rest as part of the African plate. So we know exactly where it was. We know where uh, India and Sri Lanka must be. In, uh, Sri Lanka is now part of the Indian plate and the, the, uh, the fracture zones offshore are now confined to matching those off Antarctica. And to make that happen, we are still not able to have much of a gap between Madagascar and India. So uh, we, we are confined by the data to accept this kind of picture as we move through towards the moment of, of takeoff, which is around about 88 million years ago. I just let you see the whole story a little bit more in a global perspective. Here is India, fairly centrally placed within reassembled Gondwana. We've got a huge uh, complex belt of uh, geology on the southern margin. We've got the Tethys Ocean on the, on the northern margin. And then we get the onset of disruption running down the length of the east coast of Africa and into this complex belt of orogeny to the south. And around about 155 million years ago, the, the sense of, of spreading changes. It's now possible for East Gondwana to become a strike slip, or to, or to take on a strike slip relationship against Africa. And that's exactly what it does. It's almost as though, as though it was waiting for that to be possible. And on till the end of the Jurassic, we get the outbreak of the Kogelan plume. And 
we then have the first triple junction between Australia, Antarctica, and India. And because India is confined at its southern tip, the only response that India can make is to, is to pivot between these two uh, large fault zones, a bit like this. The ridge here reorganizes, much comes much closer to the uh, to the coast of India, and then um, India takes off. So this is the point that we should switch our attention to what happened on the on the west coast. Am I going backwards? backwards yes. Sorry, I'm going backwards for the moment. Here, <laughs> thank you. Here, here we are. We're back at 120 for the time being, so that you can follow this uh, this again. Maybe there's some early rifting at this time between India and Madagascar, but uh, there is a long period in which I think there is a, a very complicated piece of uh, new crust that's uh, being grown in here. It's extended Precambrian crust, but probably not very much of it. There's maybe quite a lot of volcanism. For a long time, southern India is sitting ab above the point where the Marian hotspot is going to break out down here. And so we, we get some, uh, some magmatism, some emplacement of magma in here. And Eventually, with the takeoff of uh, of India, there's ambivalence as to whether the uh, the main active ridge is close to the Indian coast or close to the Madagascar coast. This is not an unusual situation, and at first it looks as though the uh, the, the mid ocean ridge immediately east of Madagascar is the is the dominant one. There is some, some spreading over here. The Laxmi Ridge will be a relic of this activity. But then we see the growth of the Mascarene Basin becomes predominant until about 62 million years when that growth dies. And for a while, this enormous Vishnu fracture zone becomes a real transcurrent fault with an offset of about 1,700 kilometers. And the active ridge is once again quite close to the east coast of India and no doubt influenced in some ways by the, uh, the reunion hotspot, which has uh, started out producing the Deccan traps and goes on to, uh, to leave its trail across the, uh, the whole Indian Ocean. So I've, I've given you a, a, lot to, uh, a lot to take in, but uh, I just want to end and uh, summarize in a way because i think if you're interested in studies of this sort uh, nothing short of a global view really can uh, can help you understand what's going on and in this respect i feel somewhat uh, restricted myself because I, i've only looked at half the world i've not been uh, integrating this study with what's been going on in the other hemisphere but i I've learned quite a bit across the uh, along the way. I just want to remind you um, what a, a wealth of detail exists in these ocean floor images, and this is is a, a repeat of the uh, the situation I've seen time and again with the National Aeromagnetic Surveys. There's probably 10 or 100 times more information in the data than is ever interpreted. It's just the same with these beautiful images we have of, um, of the ocean floor. And that is why I want to end on the note that really it's the, the photogeology of oceans that uh, is, is what this study is all about. There's, uh, there's so much information there now. Um, more will un undoubtedly come in, but um, as is always the case in the earth sciences, if we wait to do our interpretation until all the data has been collected from all possible sources, 
we'll never make an interpretation. And uh, the, the smart money, in my uh, estimation, goes on making the most of whatever data is available and coming out with the most credible solution. I'll finish on a, on a note that I think is, is an important one. And I presented this final animation just a, a few weeks ago at a meeting at the, the Geological Society in London. And I think the, uh, well, I hope the animation speaks for itself. Unlike a lot of workers, I've tried my best to, to model not only the, the position of the continents, but the positions of all the mid-ocean ridges that separate them. And here is a, an animation where I've simply deleted the continents. And what we're looking at is how the mid-ocean ridge system grows from the start of the Jurassic until the present day. And if you look at this in the context of the, uh, the constellation of mantle plumes that are known across this hemisphere, you're rapidly forced, I think, to the conclusion that the continental drift is not so much about continents drifting, it's about these mid-ocean ridges staying in the same place. Uh, I'm sure many in the audience are, uh, are following the progress of India. It does what we all know that it does. It moves rapidly north as time goes on, but that's mainly because down here, further south, we've got a whole series of, uh, of mantle plumes that are all driving the machinery of, uh, of global tectonics pushing India in the same direction. So if you want to uh, understand the evolution of our planet, uh, I recommend thinking of the continents, the familiar continents and their geology, simply as passengers on, on larger tectonic plates that are under the influence of uh, forces that uh, not only drive them apart, but uh, and this is the half of the story that I've totally neglected. There are undoubtedly other forces that, that suck the plates back into the, uh, the Earth's mantle in the fullness of time. So I want to end uh, by uh, thanking a whole lot of people who've contributed to, to this work in, in various ways. I, I won't mention them all. You can see the list here, but I would like to particularly thank uh, Professor Sridhar Murthy because it is through uh, his kindness and cooperation and perseverance that I've been able to enjoy uh, associations with India that uh, go back uh, almost 40 years now. I've got a website which uh, goes into more details on quite a few of the things I've been talking about. Uh, I'm very happy for individuals to contact me at my email address, which is here. And it only remains really for me to, uh, to thank you for your, your kind attention and uh, apologize that we had a, a lapse in the, in the technology somewhere halfway. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, Colin, with your permission, can I invite questions? Of course, of course. Yeah. I, I will stop sharing for the moment, and then you can you can see me again. I hope. Yes, it's there. I am. I'm back. Okay. Yes, I, I see me again now in the corner of the screen. I'm I'm happy to uh, to take questions. Nc Pant, would you like to ask something? Yeah, sure, sure. I, uh, Professor Reeves, it was very nice listening to uh, an excellent talk, actually. I do some work in Antarctica and I'm also working in Karakoram, that is Eastern Ladakh. And I see uh, this approach of, of course, looking at essentially from the ocean photography context and then looking at, so I'm working on the continental context. Mm -hmm. 
so the uh, some of the new data which i find from uh, eastern karakoram eastern ladakh let us say has some detrital data in metamorphic rocks in metamorphic rocks the zarkan is paleo to mesoarchean <coughs> very old zarkan which is not very easy to relate till we don't relate a part of tibet to australia and that is mm -hmm. what i see from some of the reconstruction which which, uh, which you have shown as separation of the indo australo antarctic triple point and uh, it seems that the tibet or parts of tibet can continue or contain some parts of australia a uh, past australia at least uh, the sourcing from us and that very well matches with what you have right what, what you have described as the motion of the indian plate and loss of the, the greater indian landmass okay thank 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 you for the question uh, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm afraid we've got the uh, the squeaky wheelbarrow has come back again at this yeah, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> this site. But yeah, yeah um, I I don't know um, nearly as much as you do about the the geology of of Antarctica or the east coast of India or, or Australia for that matter. But um, one thing that uh, occurs to me through all this work is, is that. Um, I think perhaps almost a bit, a bit, uh, naively um, we expected the, uh, the, the the geology to continue from one continent to another across the join. Um, perhaps it would if we could only reconstruct the, uh, the rifted zone more precisely, but over a distance that is often 100 or 120 kilometers. Um, it, it's often very difficult to to correlate geology and and very often the ruptures between continents um, follow lines of weakness that are themselves old discontinuities so um i i, I without wanting to uh, discourage people who are trying to map the geology I, i'm not too uh, encouraged by how far we are going to get trying to match geology across uh, across continental margins. It, it seems to me to be one of the less successful approaches uh, so far. Just one more. Uh, of uh, course. Content. Yeah, uh, we generated or part of a group. Uh, we generated some data over princess elizabeth land in uh, antarctica which is actually mm -hmm. uh, the domain where possibly the uh, the uh, triple point of the in india australia antarctica is located mm -hmm. now the yeah it's very disturbing this noise somebody's uh, mic is not switched off it's ca causing a lot of <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you've got so it too okay so well the, I'm, I'm trying my best yeah so the the geophysical data uh, magnetic data especially showed mm -hmm. a very strong uh, a 1600 nano tesla uh, anomaly inside about uh, 400 kilometer inside antarctica which mm -hmm. we interpreted as the possible suture linking india australia antarctica or coming to that now ah. the question which i wanted to ask was how good if, if one looks at the uh, such kind of continental triple points which separated in time or previously how yeah. good is the geophysical data to to register this well um <laughs> i'm all in favor of uh, as much geophysical data as possible um in, in my uh, experience, there's never enough data, and that uh, that is ultimately the uh, the problem that we we have to contend with. And I think particularly when you get down to the scale of a few tens of kilometers, 
that area of the, the triple point between Australia, Antarctica and India is, is one that underwent a very complex breakup. You've got extra fragments there like the um, Natural East Plateau and uh, maybe even uh, the, uh, a Precambrian mm -hmm. part of, the, of Kerguelen uh, that led to a, a very complex rifting history that uh, I've only uh, skated over very lightly. Um, <laughs> I, I, I guess to keep things within uh, manageable proportions, I try to focus on places where um, the, the rifting history is, is quite straightforward. And even when you uh, zoom into the, uh, the South Atlantic margins, which is uh, sort of classical plate tectonics, when you get down to field scale, the story is much, much more complicated. And uh, <laughs> I suppose life wasn't meant to be easy, but uh, it, it, it's, it's still a challenge to go from the scale that I'm working at to the scale of, uh, of field observations. But I, th I think we've got to try. <laughs> and it, if you want, if you've got the publications you uh, you can send me on on the work you've done, I'd be very interested to read them. I, if you will permit, I will send those and interact further uh, without the noise, of course. <laughs> Please do. I'll, I'll be pleased to hear from you. Most Thank most you. welcome, Sapan. Anupendu Gupta. You have raised your hand. Do you like to ask? Please unmute. <laughs> Mr. Gupta, you have to first unmute. First unmute, please. Uh, what, what I was telling, am I audible now? Yes, my yes, yes. Yes. Uh, so, in my case also, to a great extent, being a geologist and that to Precambrian geologists, my questions are also centered to the passengers who are sitting on the your scale of plates. Passenger <laughs> means the mm -hmm. uh, continental components. So my uh, uh, question is about the eastern coast of India, where mm -hmm. we have a mobile belt, we call it Eastern Ghat Mobile Belt, representing high temperature granulite rocks along the eastern coast, eastern yeah. coast of India. And there have been many hypotheses about its match with the eastern Australian continent, because mm -hmm because uh, we find that this mobile belt has got impression of crustal segments coming and docking with it from the Cambrian, uh, from Archean time, and also getting uh, a, a name of mobile belt, which is much younger to that. Uh, so now, and there is another within this, also on the northern side, there is a segment, triangular segment, which is now people are recognizing this as suspect terrains. That means a crustal fragment has come from somewhere. We do not know. We are not able to uh, uh, really designate them with any continent. It's not matching with the Indian crust. It's uh, it's far away, as you said, with the Australia. So now here, these things are live points of our uh, reckoning in the continental geology. Now, these whether these could be uh, some of your studies, whether eastern coast of India has got interactions with away, that is Australian, this thing, uh, because there are some matches when you close. So that is my question. Of course, your scale of study is much larger than what I was mentioning, a continental scale. 
Do you yeah, have uh, any magnetic or gravity or uh, any geophysical uh, signature along eastern coast of India? Yeah, no, th thank you for the question. I think m my answer is uh, is going to be much the same as uh, my answer to the, the previous question. Huh. That uh, <laughs> I, I, I wish I had the, uh, the, the data, I wish I had the, the detail, but uh, I, I, I firmly believe that we have to start looking at, uh, at whole continents and then uh, progressively focus down to the uh, to the, the more detailed uh, items and unfortunately so many of them are, are, are hidden from view uh, I, I was learning uh, at this meeting in London recently that uh, even where the margins of South America and Africa have been studied in great detail with uh, high resolution seismic surveys um, there are still so many complications that uh, that make the uh, the issue uh, <laughs> of exactly how they fit together yes. anything but straightforward. Uh, my point is that if your group keeps in view separately these problems uh, of continental crust problems that we are facing who have been working on the continent. Now, this is fascinating what you describe that it's more important to look at the ocean which is spreading and which is also uh, closing in so these are the uh, things to be understood and geophysics is the main tool for this so that's very fascinating and thank you very much for giving this uh, yeah. perspective perspective thank, thank, thank you thank you, thank you. and uh, i i think the you know, most important of all is that we uh, we keep working together and talking to each other because yes. uh, only this way do we uh, do we deepen understanding right, right. thank you may may I request dr shailesh naikji to say something please before Ms. Pasa the proposes a vote of thanks. No, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Naik, you have to unmute. Dr. Naik, you have to unmute. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your uh, very ins uh, inspiring talk. And I'm sure that you all have been a little wiser now after this talk. And uh, thank you very much and hope to be in touch with you in coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Nice to see you, your face. <laughs> those, those who want to raise a question, will you please send a mail to call in? And I assure you that you will get a reply very soon, in spite of the fact that he still gets hundreds of mails every day. <laughs> With your permission, may I now uh, request the Secretary of the Sri Krishnanunni Memorial Committee, the EVR Parthardi, to propose a formal vote of thanks. <coughs> Friends, it's my present duty to propose a vote of thanks first to Professor Colin Reeves, who has agreed to our request to deliver this today's talk. Not only that, and he has uh, adjusted to our timings, that is about six o'clock when I told him, he readily agreed for that. And then time, uh, today date also he has agreed. <coughs> Not only that, he has done, he has given us such an informative and uh, a lecture I think uh, it is opens new uh, <coughs> frontiers for our people to carry out the research. Uh, he has given a broad uh, outline. I profusely thank him for his uh, effort. And then my request to him is, if, if, if possible, share his uh, uh, <coughs> slides uh, with our uh, society, uh, uh, KMCT. You can send it to me or Professor Sridhar Murthy, if possible. Well, I thank Professor uh, Dr. Silas Naik, our president, for having ably conducted these proceedings. And uh, 
also to Professor Sridhar Murthy, who has introduced uh, Professor Reeves. Uh, and then I think uh, when Sridhar Murthy says he has uh, four, four decades of contact with him, I can claim that I have a contact with Colin Reeves for more than two and a half decades. So I was knowing him from, from late 90s onwards. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have him today in our midst. And uh, I, I, we, I thank all the participants, not only from Krishna Memorial Trust, from many other organizations who have joined today's meeting. My particular thanks to the family members of Krishna who have joined this fund, uh, this talk, and then participated fully. And I thank again, this is uh, the third of our series of Krishna Memorial Lectures. And we are waiting for the next series of lecture, next lecture in future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to see Professor Sridhar Murthy after a long, long gap. <laughs> yeah, probably he's one of the closest uh, person who's living close to my house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very nice. It's after a long gap. A few yeah, years. Gap. I'll, yes, I'll yes. catch up, Dr. Tetti. I'll call on you one of these days. Sure, sure. Please. We will, we will meet. I will see you. Nice to see you in such a usual mood and splits. I saw you. <laughs> I just want to say something about Dr. Gauri Sivarajan here, please. Gauri Sivarajan. She was there. In fact, uh, her camera is on. But maybe Parsa Digaru, if you can send the number, I'll call her separately, please. I'm so happy that Dr. Gauri Sivarajan has come here. And she's on the screen. She's a medical, yeah. uh, she's a doctor by profession and younger sister of Mr. Krishna Nundi. Mm. Yeah. Good, goodbye for now, please, to everyone. Thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.